So today's guest is going to be Primo Bellaroso, who is the gym owner of Vision Quest Muay Thai out in Maine. Very excited to talk to him. He's been watching or he's been a part of Muay Thai for a long time. He was in IFMAS and then came out to Thailand and did some commentating at both Raja Demnern and Lumpini Stadium for a absolute Muay Thai. So he got to be there for a lot of high level action, a lot of high level fights, a lot of traditional Muay Thai bouts. So it's going to be really interesting to hear him talk about his thoughts about the thing, about the sport, how things are going, just waiting for him to log on. Uh, hey, Eddie, thank you for joining. Um, excited to have you on. So uh, I'll introduce myself and kill some time while we're waiting for Primo to get uh, sorted out. I'm Matt Lucas. I am a photographer, journalist, commentator, correspondent for Muay Thai. I live out here in Thailand uh, where I've been for the last five years. So a little bit of time. I used to fight as well. I was a fighter for about 10 years semi-retired now still down for the occasional tuk-tuk fight in nissan though so if you know any tuk-tuk drivers that are in for a good run of form let me know um so i have fought at raja demner and max muay thai in isan in phuket and of course a fair amount in the states i am also the host of a few different things um one being I'm fighting in Thailand, a regular podcast I put together. Right now we're doing a series on business, so I'm really looking forward to that. The business series covers a lot of different aspects of the sport. We recently talked to Lynn Miller, um, who is the owner of Suma Lee Boxing down in Phuket. Next up, I believe, is an interview with Patrick Rivera, who is the owner of uh, Valor Training Center, which has three or four different locations. And then also I interviewed Chano Nomkin from Fairtex, hope, hopefully getting a few more high profile people on there. Uh, so things have been going very well with the podcast. I'm gonna check in with Primo again. Just give me one second. There he is. Hey man. The man of the hour, Primo, how are you? I'm good, brother. How are you? Yeah, I'm good. Um, so where are you now? And can you tell us a little bit about what you've been up to? I introduced you a little bit, but maybe for you know our audience sake, why don't you give yourself a little bit of a intro as well? Uh, yeah, man. So um, I'm in uh, Newport, Maine. Uh, mm -hmm. Recently moved from, from New York. Uh, and I am at Vision Quest headquarters, I, I guess, as it was. To open the gym in November. And uh, yeah, just finished up morning training with some of the fighters and uh, hanging out here to chit chat with you. Awesome. Sounds good. Um, so, what brought you to open up Vision Quest? And you said it's in Maine. Are there a lot of other Muay Thai or mar uh, sort of martial arts facilities in the area? No. Well, there's uh, MMA is really big in Maine. Um, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on how you look at it, uh, Muay Thai isn't quite as big in Maine. Um, right. right now, there are, uh, there's a lot of boxing coaches. There's a lot of, uh, like, you know, kickboxing slash kind of glory rule trainers. Um, but I'm pretty much the, the only, you know, I don't want to sound like a jerk. I'm probably pretty much the only qualified Muay Thai trainer. Mm -hmm. um, but most of the stand-up training that's going on is stand-up training to be put into MMA. I'm mm -hmm. hoping to be able to develop, uh, you know, real Muay Thai. Yeah, that's always good. And you have a long uh, sort of journey with this sport. Can you tell us a little bit about your background? I know you were in IFMA. You also have had a pretty successful uh, pro career in the States. Then recently you commentated out here in Thailand. So can we sort of go through the stages? Sure, yeah. Uh, so I originally 
um, I grew up boxing and uh, wrestling as a kid. Rest, wrestled and boxed through, you know, elementary, high school, and then into college. Um, got out of boxing a little bit um, when I got initially into college. I was wrestling still. Um, and then eh, probably, you know, my junior, senior year of college, I got back into boxing, got in with, with a local boys and girls club uh, with uh, an old professional that was training me then. Um, from there in New York, graduating college, I moved out to Indiana for a couple of years in the Midwest. And uh, I was looking for a good boxing gym, couldn't find a boxing gym. And uh, I went to like uh, uh, some kickboxing matches, like like old style, like booty on the feet, pant fighting kickboxing matches. And uh, so I was just watching those and uh, some dude was doing a, a jujitsu demonstration. MMA mm -hmm. had just started kind of coming around at that point. And I was like, wow, man, I guess I'll, I'll go do some jujitsu. So I started to do that. And uh, my, my trainer at the time, Lane Andrews, um, he was a professional MMA fighter, fought in Pancras in Japan, fought in Extreme Challenge, so on and so forth. When he found out I could wrestle and box a bit, I became one of his sparring partners. Mm. So one thing led to another. I started kind of getting into MMA, but the truth was I kept, I kept get, getting kicked in the leg a ton, <laughs> and I hated it. And I was like, man, this sucks. I mean, there was no, there was no Muay Thai really happening. In the US right. at that time. Not much at all. And, uh, I mean, this is circa 99, 2000, oh. maybe. You know what I mean? This is a while ago. Um, and uh, so I kept getting kicked in the leg. I thought, boy, this sucks. I've got to learn some Muay Thai so I can defend a leg mm -hmm. kick. And really, my sole purpose was to stop myself from getting kicked in the leg. That was <laughs> it. You know, literally, like, I'm, I'm going to go. And it turned out that in Indiana at that time, uh, uh, Saksan, had moved there and was teaching. Nobody knew who he was or anything like that. And somebody is, oh, there, you know, I went to a fight. Somebody was selling some Muay Thai gear and had his car. And I was like, well, Matt, I'll go train. I'll go train with this guy. I had no idea who he was. I get there and I find out, wow, you know, like this is the Punisher. Like he's, he's actually kind of a big deal. And uh, so I started training, training with him. But again, I'm really only training with him so that I can be better at MMA. At that, had a couple MMA fights. Um, managed to kick a few guys in the leg, which was fun. Myself, not get kicked in the leg, which was a bonus. And uh, then I moved back to New York. Uh, okay. Well, at that time, uh, in New York, MMA was illegal. Mm -hmm. Um, there was no no gi jujitsu happening in New York mm -hmm. at that time, and I was interested in doing MMA. So I really had very little interest in wearing gi doing jujitsu. Uh, right. At that time, Henzo Gracie was in like, he was upstairs from a methadone clinic in, <laughs> in town. Like it, it, was, it, was, it was a mess. And mm -hmm. uh, he only had no gi one time a week. There was, there was one time a week that he did no gi at that time. That's how like, how new everything was, right? right. Uh, and I was like, man, I, I don't want to wear gi. This, this kind of sucks. And it turned out I was pretty good at stand-up. So uh, Saxon had said, when you go to New York, you have to, because I was, I was a big puncher from coming from boxing. And uh, he was like, so when you go to New York, you have to train with my friend Koban, who is oh, okay. uh, also a big puncher. You know what <laughs> I mean? He was like, you guys, you guys are going to get along great, right? Yeah. So I ended up finding Koban. Koban's like, like, there was, there was a big, big place called Chow's and it was, it was a huge like warehouse loft in New York. And basically every martial arts instructor in the city rented hours and the place was oh. huge. So you literally, yeah, dude, you'd go in and there'd be like, Koban would be teaching a Muay Thai class over here. And then over in this corner, like there'd be some guy teaching a capoeira class. And over here, there'd oh. be some guy like Kung Fu sword fighting and shit. It was oh. wild. Um, and so I started training with Koban. Uh, I was lucky enough to train with Koban on his farm upstate, which was pretty cool. And, and you know, uh, if you ever watched Koban fight, his training is pretty much exactly the same. Uh, yeah. You know, it's you take, you give back. <laughs> you take, you give back. You know what I mean? Yeah. Um, so, so I trained with him for a little while and then, you know, kind of broke out on my own. Um, 
Muay Thai was very non-existent. You know what I mean? There were, you know, obviously there was Koban. Right. Um, but early for Muay Thai, especially on the East Coast, because we didn't have warm weather. So, the, right. you know, this kind of, you know, fast forward 15 years, and this is why California ended up, like, coming out of the box a little bit quicker than, like, the East Coast. Mm -hmm. uh, because due to the weather, the ties were more attracted to coming to California. Yeah. And I, not was, attracted. I was that? born in New York, and I moved to California because of the weather. Right. So, you know, far, far in New York, people. yeah, in New York, you basically, like, you trained with Koban mm -hmm. originally, or you trained with some people that maybe kind of knew Muay Thai, maybe kind of didn't, you know. Um, so what I ended up doing after a while was uh, I, you know, I had gotten, you know, the, the, the Fairtex flyer in the mail, the equipment <laughs> flyer. Uh -huh. And um, it had the San Francisco gym's number on it. Mm -hmm. And, uh, I, you know, I'd, I'd fought a few times, um, you know, one, but it, it was, it was ugly. Um, I had, um, I had done, you know, some boxing matches, some Muay Thai fights. Um, mm -hmm. I had done, uh, uh, some San Chow fights, kind of Muay Thai with takedowns and throws. I mean, I just wanted to fight yeah. and, um, I knew I needed better training. Mm -hmm. So, um, so I called the, the, the gym in San Francisco, the phone number that was, that was on the, on the, the flyer. And, uh, uh, and Alex Gong answered the phone. And oh. I was like, what? Wait a second. You know what I mean? Like, I mean, Alex Gong was, was a big deal uh, yeah. for American Muay Thai, especially at that time. Yeah, was it that the time when he was like on uh, Black Belt Magazine? Oh, yeah. Yeah, he was on the cover of Black Belt Magazine. Like, you know what I mean? The ISKA, you know, world champ. Um, I think you, what was the name of that show? Strike Force. Yeah, Strike Force. At that time, that was how, you know what I mean? That was on ESPN or ESPN two That's late at true. night. Yeah, a lot of you the know, early guys was fought on there, like Johnson on and Bunker. Yeah, uh, and that you know that was a lot of people's first introductions. Absolutely, you know what I mean? Yeah, you'd just be you know sitting around at two o'clock in the morning watching ESPN, and it would be like, uh, what was it? Uh, 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 World of Asian Martial Arts or something was the name of the show at like two o'clock in the morning. And it would be like, you know, they, they'd show 20 minutes of like Team Paul Mitchell, like, you know, <laughs> doing, doing, doing that stuff and then blah, blah. And then all of a sudden, like, there'd be a ring and they'd be, they'd be showing Alex Gong fighting, mm -hmm. right? So, uh, so I, call, I called the, the gym and Alex answered the phone and I was like, holy shit, like, this dude's a big deal, like, and he's just answering the phone at the gym, right? Who does that? You know, he's famous. Yeah. And uh, so I started talking to him, and I basically, like, you know, kind of gave him my background a little bit. And he was like, he was like, man, you, you know, standard Alex, like, you need to get on a plane and come down here and train. Yeah. And, you know, I was like, man, I'm just, I'm just, you know, I'm living in a, in a basement apartment that, that, like, like, I'm living in a basement apartment that looks into the alley in Harlem at this time, like this, this is how poor I am. You know what I mean? Yeah. And uh, I'm like, yeah, yeah. I, I'd never flown. I don't know if I told you that. I'd never flown in my life. Well, you know, I'm a poor kid from New York. So uh, he's like, you gotta come out to San Francisco and train. And I'm like, yeah, that, that just, that's not in my wheelhouse. And um, he got me a sponsor. Oh, like, wow. Yeah, like, like next thing I know, uh, I'm talking to him and he's like, he's like, I got a guy. Um, He'll sponsor you and, and fly you out. Wow. Wow. So, like, so, so I'm fucking on a plane flying to San Francisco. I'd literally flown one time in my life when I was like seven <laughs> years old. And uh, now I'm on a plane. I got, you know, I got my, my like Muay Thai hobo stick and, I'm, <laughs> and I'm, I'm going to Fairtex, you know? And um, I get there and he'd given me some information to like stay at like a youth hostel um, mm -hmm. down the road. This is, uh, this is the old Clementine. Yeah. Gym. So, no area so much yeah so uh um yeah so i so i get there he sends somebody to the airport in a van to pick me up oh, brings cool. me back yeah yeah get to the gym introduce myself he introduces me you know uh you know junks on and uh bunkered uh uh Ganyao, all the guys right yeah. and um I mean, Gilbert Melendez is just like a, like a fat Mexican kid with long hair that's like just learning how to do jujitsu at that time. It's a, it's hilarious when I think back on it. 
you know? Yeah. And um, so anyways, I trained that day and I hadn't gone to the youth, youth hostel yet because it was, you know, typical Alex, like, get off, get at it, let's go, right? So uh, I hit the gym, it's like, it's like the three o'clock fighter training. Mm-hmm. And he's literally like, get, your, get changed, let's go. So I, yeah. I get changed. I get clinch fucked by everybody in that gym, okay? Like, dude, I, I had wrestled, and that's the only thing that, like, sort of kept me alive. Like, you know, there was no real clinching going on in New York. You know what I mean? Sure. Um, so I, I was completely out of my league. Um, uh, Linda, like, I, dude, I had chicks that were just crushing me mm-hmm. in clinch. So we get done. I'm shot. And Alex is, like, going to gonna take me up to the youth hostel. And he's like, so how long are you staying? And I was like, well, you know, funds are tight. Um, right. but, I, but I think I can stay about a month. Uh-huh. And uh, it's not bad, right? Do what I can. And uh, Alex was like, well, if you don't have to pay for a place to stay, how, mm-hmm. how long can you stay? And I was like, well, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to get back to my real job, being a trainer right. in New York. Like, I'm not getting paid while I'm gone. But I think I can, I can probably do two months if I don't have to pay for a place to stay. And he handed me a key to the gym. Oh, wow, wow. And I like, he was like, you can sleep upstairs on the mats. Uh, uh. And I was like, you got to be, like, he just handed me the key to the gym, you know, like the Fairtex yeah, gym, yeah. you know. And, and he just, he was, he was like, look, this is the most expensive and precious thing in my life. Treat it that way. Right. And I was like, yeah, no problem, man. And so, like, I, I slept on the mats for two months and, and trained with those guys and, and started yeah. learning. And then, you know, that became me going back to New York, practicing what I had been taught while I was in San Francisco, and then saving up my money and flying back out and repeating the whole process. You know what I mean? And then in that time, obviously, like, had more Muay Thai fights, got connected with other people that I was able to train with. Um, and then eventually being on the IFMA team, eventually uh, I was on the IFMA team in 2004. Um, mm-hmm. That was after Alex's death. Um, at, at that time, like, uh, you know, Junk Snot had kind of taken over, looking out for me. Um, and then, uh, you know, turned pro eventually, uh, went 14-1 and as a pro, um, yeah. won, won some titles, uh, got to travel around. I fought, I fought Thailand three times. Um, oh. Fought, uh, fought in Mexico, fought in, you know, uh, fought in Australia. Um, so pretty cool. Like, I mean, for the most part, I, I tell everybody, like, you know, I owe, I owe my life to Muay Thai. There's, yeah. um, there's not one stamp in my passport that isn't a direct, even today, there's not one stamp in my passport that's not a direct result of Muay Thai. Right. It was either, I, you know, I flew somewhere to fight or I flew somewhere to train or I flew somewhere to be a trainer. Um, so like, you know, I mean, I met my wife through Muay Thai. Right. Uh, you know what I mean? She started training, we were training, started dating, now we're, you know, married. Um, yeah. I mean, literally, literally every, everything in my life has, has come from Muay Thai. Yeah, well, one of the other things that came through Muay Thai was your commentating. Um, you worked for a while with uh, Friday Night Fights, and then also at Raja Damanon and Lumpini with Absolute Muay Thai. Can you talk a little bit about what it was like doing sort of the traditional stadium uh, circuit? Yeah, that was, I mean, pretty wild. You know what I mean? Like, uh, um, I tried to express in, in at least some of the broadcasts, like, uh, the importance or the emotion for somebody that, that grew up you know, doing Muay Thai and really loving this sport, like, you know, Lumpani and Raja Domnerans are, are the meccas, right? Um, and, like, it's a big deal uh, for a fighter or somebody that's in Muay Thai. It's a big deal just, just to be able to go to those stadiums and watch fights and, and be in that atmosphere. It's a big deal to be able to fight in those stadiums. It's an even bigger deal, right? And, and to be, like, you know, one of the few Americans to have broadcast from from those stadiums is is i mean just wild you know like sometimes i sit and i'm like i'm like wow i've i've gotten to call fights at madison square garden lumpany and rajadamner um i mean 
than the cat. I don't know if there's anybody else that can say that really. You know, yeah. you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, so I've, I've literally gotten to, I've gotten to witness fights and call fights at the biggest fight stadiums in the world, you know? Um, and again, I'm just, I'm just, I'm just some bum from New York that, that wanted to fight, you know, it's pretty awesome. So, uh, Muay Thai at the stadiums, very different than even large Muay Thai shows here, here in the United States. Right. Um, the, the crowd slash the betters. Are, are just a much bigger part of what's going on. Um, it is, uh, you know, a, a lot of people say that like, like uh, 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 Thailand has a, what, a, a, a democratic monarchy, right? Uh, they have a king, but they vote on things, right? Um, I say what they have is functional anarchy, typically, <laughs> you, right? Like, I mean, if you want to see functional anarchy, get get on a motor scooter and drive through Bangkok. Yeah. It's functional it's anarchy, well. like, right? It works, and it works because everybody accepts that it works. Um, and that's a little bit how like Muay Thai fights are. It's like it's it's functional anarchy a little bit. Everything inside the ring is completely controlled. Everything outside of the ring, not as controlled, or not as controlled as like, you know, what an American would think yeah. they'd be walking into yeah. you know what i mean I, I actually think it's very controlled but it's hard for a lot of foreigners to understand right because yeah it's not only a different culture and a different language but it's a subset of that language as well yeah so yeah. you know there's you know it's like going to the horse track or something yeah they speak english but it's a different culture it's like the horse right. they're, not, they're not speaking my english right <laughs> yeah yeah Yep. Everybody there speaks that language. Yeah. And, I, and I've got to learn that language still. You know what I mean? Yeah. yeah. It's so pretty awesome too, like, uh, you know, and just as, as like a spectator, somebody that buys a ticket or somebody that watches on TV, um, you know, you may, not, you may not see that, but like being a commentator um, or, or being a coach or a member of one of the camps that's coming to the stadium, like, like you, you – you see the importance of these fights. Mm -hmm. You see the importance of these young boys working their way up to being able to fight on, on that level. The money that they can make by being able to fight on that level. Like, you know what I mean? Like, like you, you grasp that importance, yeah. you know? Um, so, you know, having that experience in Thailand and out uh, in the States as well, what do you think are some of maybe two or three of the big differences? Uh, and between uh, fighting in Thailand and fighting in the United States? Yeah. Um, I, think, I think, honestly, the, the, the biggest difference is, is the importance. And, it, and, it, and it's strange because it goes both ways. So, like, so in Thailand they fight often mm -hmm. and so when it's time to fight it's no big deal yeah right no it's, everybody cares but nobody cares right mm -hmm. yeah. i've got a fight next saturday i found out on wednesday awesome <laughs> and, and it's no big deal because that's how that's how it works and yeah. and coaches it, it's not that the trainers don't care but it's not a big deal let's ah, come on we're gonna go we're gonna go fight okay yeah. cool I'm gonna, I'm gonna go fight right um it's a big deal that like you know in Thailand that, that you, you want to win and you want to improve mm -hmm. so that you can build yourself and you can make more money. Um, in the United States, you know, even an amateur, an amateur can have more fights than a professional typically. There's just more yeah. opportunities. Mm -hmm. um, but in the United States, if you, amateur professional, if you fight six times in a year, that's a lot of fights. Yeah. That's a lot. That's you know what good. I mean. Like you fought every other month. That was yeah. that was a lot. That's a hard schedule to keep. And in Thailand, if you're an active fighter and you had six fights, you didn't you didn't fight this year. Yeah, it's most most active fighters are fighting eight to ten times, you know, a year, and that's yeah. like at high level, you know. And at the higher levels, the guys aren't fighting as active. Lower level guys are, you know, especially Alan Isan, and you can fight multiple times a month. Oh, absolutely. And you want to. A, that's, yeah. that's the only way that you're making any money to, to try to live and support you and your family. B, that's the only way that you're going to build up 
to to getting to a to a bigger bigger arena to making it to Bangkok. You know what I mean? Um, yeah. So that that's one of the biggest things. So in the United States, every fight is high pressure. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? Every yeah. fight is very like, oh my god. And then it's like, oh, you know, this guy called me for a fight, and it's only four weeks away. I need a I need an eight week training camp. <laughs> yeah. You, you know what I mean? Um, and that's and that's not even counting dropouts. You know what I mean? If if I had if I actually had a fight for every fight I was scheduled to have in the United States, I'd have three times the amount of fights. <laughs> that I, you know what I mean? If if every grandmother actually died, <laughs> or every guy that pulled out of a fight because his grandmother died, there'd be no grandmothers in the United yeah. States, right? Um. So you know that's you know you, you you eight weeks. Oh man, I'm ramping up. I'm ramping up. I'm killing myself. I'm dieting. Blah 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 blah. And then. Oh, that guy can't do it. We're three days away. Yeah, yeah, exactly. You know, um, and so that that's that's really a hard thing. Um, yeah. you know, the big I guess so. What it comes down to is in Thailand, it's it's a job and a career. Yeah. And in Muay in the United States, it's a pastime. It's a hobby. Yeah. You know, hobby. even as a professional, even as a professional, it's it's a full time hobby. Yeah. Mm-hmm. You know? I mean, I I do think that there's uh, slowly becoming inroads to develop as a professional Muay Thai yeah. fighter. Guys like Kevin obviously have done it, you know, but he's, you know, done a lot of the hard yards. Um, speaking of Kevin, though, you will be commentating his fight uh, on June 12th at Triumphant 11. Can you talk a little bit about that and what you expect from it? Man, I'm, I'm, first of all, I am so absolutely psyched uh, to be commentating that show. Um, I've been at least a year to a year and a half off the mic. Um, mm. So I'm just hyped to be, able, to be able to get back on the mic and be at, be at a live show and, and call it. Um, big thank you to uh, Dimitri, uh, also owns Muay Thai Addict, uh, for putting me on. Um, I'm hyped for that. I'm hyped to be on the mic, and I'm hyped to be on, on the mic for this show. Mm. Um, it's got Kevin Ross on it. I mean, that's... That's the man for American Muay Thai. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I mean, honestly, uh, could be probably the man for North American Muay mm-hmm. Thai. You know what mm-hmm. I mean? Like, like there's some you you uh, you know Vargas. You could say in Canada, there. You know what I mean? Uh, yeah. There's a, there's a few guys in Canada, but but the truth of it is nobody nobody has the reach that mm-hmm. Kevin Ross has yeah, from Muay Thai done- in in North America. He's done a great job sort of building this for having a very, very strong personality. Although, you know, when you meet him personally, he's pretty quiet and reserved. Always. But like, you know, in terms of like his media presence, how he presents himself in the ring, uh, he's done a really great job, like sort of building a persona. Yeah. Um, and, and really what it is, is like, that's Kevin. Like he's he's just a super genuine dude. Yeah. Um, you know what I mean? Um, what I you know I, I have to say it first. Like, like Kevin and I are buddies. You know I I've known Kevin for a long time. Um, I've helped work Kevin's corner at times when he fought in New York. Uh, trained with him in Vegas. Um, and he's always been a very genuine person. Yeah. And as his as his you know star has risen. He still stayed like that, yeah. that super genuine person, you know. I still get will get I'll get text messages from him all the time. Hey man, I got a guy that's, you know, contacted me, some dude that he doesn't even know, just sent him a message. Yeah. That I'm moving to the East Coast somewhere. Typically it's New York or New Jersey. Where should I train? Mm-hmm. And Kevin will message me and be like, Hey, th- this guy messaged me. He's right. moving to New York needs a place to train. He's going to be in this area. Where do you think? I'm not as familiar with the gyms out there. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that's, that's not even somebody that's like his boy. That's, that's kind of a fan yeah. that has randomly messaged him and said, you know, I'm, I'm looking to make this move. And where do you, where would you recommend I train? And he goes out of his way to, yeah. to do things like that. And he performs. Yeah. You know, what I mean? it's all worth nothing if, you, if you're not a good fighter, right? Right. And so let's talk a little bit about his performance because it is a big bow. You know, uh, some people have said it, it's a potential changing on the guard. It's a style matchup. 
Uh, he's performing against Asa Tenpao in the main event on that show. Uh, what do you expect to, for it, for things to happen there? Oh, wow. I mean, Ace is just awesome. You know what I mean? Like, like he's, he, you know, he's the American ninja, right? Yeah. Um, super athletic. What's super athletic, bro? He's one of those guys that, like, I believe if he concentrated on nearly any sport, he could excel at that sport. Yeah. You know what I mean? Luckily for us, he's decided to concentrate on fight sports, right? Um, but it, but it, if, if, if Asa Tempau decided, like, that he wanted to concentrate on soccer, he'd be a professional soccer player. You know, if he, you know, wanted to run marathons, he'd be a professional runner. Like, he's, he's just that athletic. And, you know, you watch any video of him and stuff, he's just that committed to the training. You know yeah. what I mean? Um, I don't want to give the impression that Asa is just all natural talent. Like, holy yeah. cow, the work ethic that he has. Um, so this fight, like, these are the types of fights that need to happen in the United States. Yeah. Um, the, the best guys need to fight each other. You yeah. Know? And I think, I think sometimes I was, I was really thinking on this the other day about like, why don't the best guys fight each other mm -hmm. all the time? Right. And, and I think sometimes it's because some of them don't want to. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think sometimes what happens is, you know, guys get locked into contracts with various <laughs> promotions. Yeah. And, and it's not that they don't want to fight each other. It's that, you know, uh, you know, this guy's in a contract with Bellator. And then this guy's in a contract with Lion Fight. And then yeah. this guy's in a contract with, with whatever. Yeah. And so they can never fight each other, mm -hmm. you know? And so I think that fighters need to want to fight each other. Mm -hmm. But I also think there's something with promoters, and it's tough. I know, like... Yeah, you know, the margins for promoter are not big, right? Um, you spend a lot of time and a lot of money in order to build a fight. Yeah. And now it's kind of that promoter's commodity, right? Mm -hmm. um, to have that, to let that fighter fight off promotion doesn't yeah. make them any money. Or yeah, to let yeah. that fighter fight off promotion and potentially lose, yeah. now it's hurt their, it's hurt their product. And, and I understand that, um, but there has to be a way. There, you know, there, there just has to be a way to be able to get guys that are signed on various promotions to be, to be able to fight together, you know? Yeah. Well, it definitely seems like, you know, Triumphant 11 is going to have that happen. Uh, very yeah. happy for Muay Thai Addict and everyone working the show, the fighters and the commentators. Uh, just wrapping things up, uh, is there anything you want to talk about that we didn't? And uh, where can people find you on social media or follow along with Vision Quest? Cool. Easy, easy. First things first. Easiest thing to get a hold of me is Primo Bellarosa. It's mm -hmm. Primo Bellarosa on Facebook. Primo Bellarosa on Instagram. Uh, Vision Quest Muay Thai on Facebook and Instagram as well. Cool. Super easy to find. Um, I'm right in Maine, um, and I'm open to anybody that wants to wants to come in and train. From you know housewives up to professional fighters. I I got you covered. Um, for this triumphant show, like, man, get a ticket. And if you can't get a ticket, get the pay-per-view. And I know that, like, there's a, there's a lot of talk of, you know, support the sport, buy the pay-per-view, support the sport, buy the pay-per-view. And I, and I agree with that. Um, yeah. But the real deal is, dude, if you're into fighting, get this, get this pay-per-view. And, yeah. and get, like, dude, this card is stacked. The, yeah, it's very, very I don't good. know what else they've announced, so, uh, so I'm not going to talk about yeah. it. But, but they oh. have announced the main event, and that is a fight that you, if you're into, if you're into Muay Thai, you have to watch that fight. But if you're just into fights, you have to watch that fight. Yeah, also on the card is uh, Iman, Iman Barlow, who's taking on Becca Irwin. That's a yeah. super high-profile female fight. Bout. Uh, there's some other great bouts that um, will be announced shortly. You know, things, as always, are getting sorted out. But um, thank you so much for your time, Primo. I'm very excited to hear more from you uh, on the mic and then some hopefully upcoming interviews with some of the fighters. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, hopefully um, I'm going to be doing some lives. I'm going to have to figure out how to run the lives, you know. Yep. But uh, hopefully I'm going to be doing a couple live interviews in the next couple of weeks uh, with 
Ace Tempau and Kevin Ross kind of get their thoughts on the fight that's coming up. I'll, you know, I'll rap with them a little bit. I know a little bit of their histories. So we'll talk a little bit about that and, and hopefully, you know, get them some, them some publicity and get the fights some publicity and, you know, stir things up a little bit. Yeah, for sure. Well, thank you so much, Primo. Man, Matt, thank you. I, I really appreciate it, dude. No uh, worries. I mean, I'm sure a lot of people on here already know you, but for anybody that tuned into this based on me and not Matt, Matt I say this all the time, Matt Lucas has his finger on the pulse of Muay Thai. I totally believe that. I believe that since the day I met him. Uh, follow all his social medias and his writings. Very, very good stuff. Very informative stuff. Thank you. Matt, talk to you later, brother. I'll talk Bye, to you later.